It was a dreamless sleep of non-existence. And then suddenly I didn't die. You could have told me that I had died in that moment and I would have said, I know I could tell it happened. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Visit betterhelp.com slash Padilla because sometimes existing is exhausting. And if you wanna watch this episode completely ad-free with absolutely no censorship, click the join button down below to become a member just like all these very wonderful people. Anyway. Hello, Michael. Anthony, Hello. how you doing? I am good, thank you. Or should I say, hey Vsauce. Michael, right here, right, right here, right yes. here, sitting in this room with me right now. I appreciate it. That yeah. is the line. Why do you think the way that you present science and the mysteries of reality is so special? Why do you think it resonates so well with so many people? Look, I don't know. I would love for you to answer that question. So for me, it feels like I can never anticipate where you're taking your thought process. Mm. And the way you describe, it almost feels like we're solving a mystery together. Mm -hmm. And there's something about the, the speaking cadence too. There's a very specific way that you deliver the information where it feels like I'm on the edge of my seat. Right, okay, sure, sure. Was that purposeful? I, I think that's just the way that I talk. Really? And, yeah, and so it was very lucky that I um, tried public speaking. That was how I always talked anyway. Mm. I, I'm not trying to perform in a certain way. You're not putting on a Vsauce character? Not really. I mean, I definitely amp up who I normally am. Yeah. But I don't know. I don't know if it's like a genetic thing <laughs> or if I just developed over time an ability to like, hold on, pay attention. I think beyond that, I also try to keep the episodes very kind of humble and open so that it's not really like, look, we can dismiss all of this stuff and here's the truth. It's more like a, we don't know anything. And there's something awesome about feeling weak and small. While watching it and even by the time I get to the end, I realize that there's so much more to learn and be curious about. Yeah, me too. I remember people asked me 12 years ago, man, when are you gonna run out of topics? Yeah. And I was like, I don't think I will. Right. And no one asks me that anymore. I almost feel like the entire culture has realized we're never gonna run out of questions. Yeah, I mean, you showed up today with notebooks of different topics that you wanna yeah. cover that you've been wanting to cover for months, years? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you just haven't been able to get down to it? Well, these are just the last, the most recent four journals that I've written in. And I've been dancing around a certain topic. Are they, is this the same topic in all of these? No, not at all. Um, it's, a, it's like a combination. I'm not sure how many videos are in there. It could yeah. be three or it could be eight. Can we get a close up on this? This is just, just this. Let me make sure nothing's too private. <laughs> um, oh, well, I think this is about the definition of an odd number. I think I made a ding episode about this. And this all just comes from you being curious about something or you like, how do you decide what the things are? I that guess you... what I would say, those journals are full of me trying to teach something. It's me trying to explain both to myself and others the answer to some question. So you become curious yourself and you do the research because you want to know. Yeah, so I'll think something like, okay, what I'm, what I'm currently dancing around is this question of what is the impact of our lives being more and more disembodied? You know? Right. I, if I'm tweeting or making TikToks, I'm not existing as this physical body in front of an audience. I'm making a thing that's like almost permanent. Mm. That, that my tweets will be there verbatim for as long as Twitter continues to serve them up. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I just see you on the street and I say something to you, um, it, it evaporates away. That's just one little part of the 30 things I've been looking at and writing mm. about for years. And I keep going, well, this video isn't ready yet, but selfies were a part of this topic. Yeah. So I took the selfie concept, I just made that its own video. Right. And I'm like, why is a photograph so different than like a self-portrait? It was easy to take a selfie for a long time, but there wasn't like a demand for it. You know, you could take a Polaroid camera and hold it out like this and take a picture, and many people did. Mm -hmm but they didn't put a mirror on a Polaroid camera so that I could see that I was framed mm. until like the last decade. Did people used to look older was part of it. Yeah. And I made that its own video. Mm. So I just keep shedding little videos off of this. But I think that if people gave me five years, I could turn this into a big documentary. Mm. And, and the kind of concept that's there is, are we attached to our past selves in a way that makes them always feel present? 
yeah, questions like that. The the past is completely gone. Right. By definition. I mean, even if I could time travel back to say 1950, I wouldn't know what it was like to be in 1950 because my brain is from 2023. That also raises the question, a question that I've had for a while, because we always have this reference material for what our past was like. We have the old photos that we can always look back to. Does that give us some kind of weird anchoring to our past that we can't escape? Basically, I would say, yes. It's pretty mind boggling to think that we've always had pools of water, uh -huh. okay? But you cannot see what you look like with your eyes closed in a reflection. Mm -hmm. Mirrors are weird. It's like a piece of art that you can't take anywhere. Mm -hmm. It's temporary. When I move away from it, it's gone. I can't say, oh, that's a good one. I'm going to send this to my mom. Mm -hmm. But then painting comes along. Not accessible to everyone. Not everyone's getting their portrait painted. Yeah. Photography changes the game. Now I know what I look like from the outside. I know what I look like with my eyes closed. Even when I FaceTime someone, part of the screen is me. Mm -hmm. I can watch myself talking to other people. Mm. I'm not a performer anymore. I'm a spec former. I'm a, uh, a spectator and a performer. Well, and you're I, almost performing for the idea of what you think will, you'll be seen as from the outside. And people have always done that. Yeah. But the tools to do it now are incredibly stronger in degree. I want to do a lot of stuff about perception and color illusions. But then I also want to talk a lot about cultivation theory. What's cultivation theory? That's the idea that we gain our idea of what's real and what's normal from the media. Okay. I mean, yeah. So obviously, this, yeah. Is, this isn't some kind of like crazy theory, but the, the specific research on its effects are really fascinating. For example, the percentage of Americans that someone thinks work as police officers and doctors correlates almost exactly with how much TV they watch. The more TV they watch, the more police officers they think there are in the country hmm. because they're overrepresented in media. I think that a lot of like outlandish conspiracy theories aren't necessarily caused by like, whoa, you've been watching too many movies where conspiracy theories happen. It's like, no, you've just been watching a lot of movies. The medium is the message, Anthony. Just watching a movie means that you're watching a reality with an author. Everything was done as a choice because that's what authors get to do. Mm. And then when you look at the real world and it's not directed and dramaturged and produced the way a movie would be made, you get suspicious. This can't be real. Mm. All those children aren't wearing coats, but it was 12 degrees that morning. Mm. What's going on? The answer is kids don't always wear coats, right. but in a movie, they wouldn't have made that mistake because it would have been distracting. Right. It would have looked like a mistake. Mm. And we've become so accustomed to movies telling us what's real that we look at reality and something's wrong. People will believe the impossible, but they will not accept the improbable. I can write a story about people who fly. Perfect. Yeah. But if two people just happen to bump into each other at the exact right time to push the story forward, that's lazy. Right, because that but seems like a coincidence. It's man. a coincidence. It's it, The author could have chosen to do this better, but like a person turning into a dragon, cool. I'll buy it. Right. I can suspend my disbelief, but I will not suspend my disbelief in that weird like coincidence that the day of the tragedy, the police happened to have new people on the phones. Come on. Have you always been such an inquisitive person? Probably. Yeah? When you were younger, were you always like, I got to learn about that. I got to learn about that. Or, or is this something that developed it's to the degree? It's not just learning. It's sharing insights. When I understand something, I'm happy, but I want to tell other people. So look at how lucky am I? That's my job. I can say, oh, I understand that theorem now. Now I get to share it with others and hopefully help speed them along that process of understanding right. it. And from the outside, I assume that you had a team of researchers, of writers. Mm. Of, it just seems like it's so polished what you do that it's been interpreted by dozens of people before well, it's ended up on the screen. I mean, it has, but they don't know it. They wrote books about it. They gave lectures about it. And then I watched and synthesized, but I do the research all by myself and I write the scripts and then I film them all alone in a room and then I edit them myself. You said that 
some of the classes that you took in high school actually helped get you on track for this? Oh, definitely. Yeah, I think um, I was so lucky to have a really good forensics extracurricular program in high school. I don't know if everyone knows what forensics is. Yeah, that was definitely not offered at my high school. I got wood shop. <laughs> forensics in high school was um, competitive public speaking. Every weekend I would go to a different high school and I would perform my speech. You'd go to other high schools? Yeah. because In front of kids you don't know? In front of the parents of children I don't know. That is The horrifying. parents were the judges. Doing some sort of public speaking com competitively a lot when you're younger helps so much. I avoided it, like the plague. Anthony, Speaking. we can tell. Look at how you turned out. <laughs> oh, I know, I know. I'm, I'm years but behind But you've got a, like, an kids. instinct for performance. You started on YouTube way before me. You were part of the wave of like people that made me realize this is the new thing. Really? Smosh? So different from what you do. Is it? The, look, at, look at my older videos. Vsauce started with Mario farts. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and and you're doing a horrible Italian accent. Hey, it's a me, a Mario. Let's eat a mushroom. Mm, nom, nom, nom. Delish, yeah, delish. Uh, horrible, fantastic. Horribly tomato, fantastic. Tomato. Can you talk about the evolution of the style of your videos? Because they used to be a lot shorter. They used to be a little bit more sillier. As the moon made of cheese, and then you've slowly but surely evolved your content to feel more like feature length documentaries in a sense. I wanted to be taken more seriously. I made a video about how, you know, nothing really touches. And then Minute Physics made a video that was like, well, I mean, it depends what you mean by touch. And I was like, dang, I wanna be better than I am. And so that really changed. I changed from doing like two videos a month that were like, well, why do we play games? And why do we wear clothing to become did clothing make us smarter? I'm looking into the way the body stays warm and just the practice of making clothing to connect hand motions to what you're seeing. Does that train us to now write things? And like, mm. oh my gosh, like if it wasn't for underwear, we wouldn't have books. Mm. That's a crazy, I just came up with that right now, but it's <laughs> yeah. like, maybe there's something to it. <laughs> yeah. And I want to look into it because this is a novel thesis. So the way that information has become so abundant on the internet, it was almost like you didn't have to present that anymore. That's right. You had to go deeper. You had to present something in a way that had- That hadn't had... already been presented. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So illusions of time. A yeah. video about like, why does it blow our minds to realize that, you know, the Apollo moon landing and today have the Lion King release right in between. Them. God, I love that video. I love that video so much. I mean, there, even, even thinking back to like as far away as the Roman Empire was to us is how far away the ancient Egyptians were to the Roman To the Empire. Romans, right? Yeah. Why do we get that so wrong? Why is that so unintuitive? Because the past feels closer together and the present feels further apart when you start thinking about because you could, you know all the events that happened. That happened in between them. That was an idea that I had to come up with. I didn't right. just look it up and say, oh, look, there's a book about it, or there's been right. a, years of research on it. I was looking at like micro studies on time perception and going, well, maybe that's also relevant to long time scales. But then there's also this other effect, and then there's this other thing. And I had to come up with names for them because no one had ever given that phenomenon a name. I talked about like chronosonder. The weird oh, yeah. feeling of, man, people 50 years ago drove on this same road and they had their own like stresses and they were not thinking about me. They weren't thinking, well, I'm in the past. They were like, it's, t it's now. And now I'm driving on the road 50 years later and I think of them as like little cardboard cutout, like precursors to me. I'm the main character. Yeah. They were the prequel. And then I'm like, no, they thought they were the main character mm. and I'm just like the sequel. A lot of people have started to create their content with the algorithm in mind. Mm -hmm. What is the, the, the click-through rate? What is the viewer retention? How can I make this as streamlined as possible? But it feels like you're making content that is for the viewer. It's, is, is that in mind? Like, are you keeping that in mind? I do think there's a danger of deciding to make content for the algorithm, not for your audience. And you might have some success, but then you start to get really burned out because you're like making videos for a robot that doesn't love you. <laughs> and you're chasing something where there's no clear finish line. Yeah. You're just constantly chasing. Yeah. Um, and so it winds up being unfulfilling and 
unfair. If you look at the stuff that does the best, it's not always the most algorithmically optimized. Right, it's not always the Mr. Beast face with the brightest green and blue sky you've ever seen. It's not always that. Look at TikTok. Some of the biggest videos are just some random thing that happened to really hit a nerve or the excitement bone of the population. The algorithm noticed that. It was like, holy cow, people are watching this whole thing and they're sharing it and they're screenshotting it? Let's start spreading this out. It wasn't necessarily because of some rigorously scientifically planned algorithmic structure. It's a chicken and the egg. Yeah. Because the algorithm might suggest things I didn't know I wanted to watch, but maybe it only knows that because it knows a bit more about what I did in the past than I remember. And I mean, if you design stuff based on the algorithm, you're essentially designing things based on the past. I love that. That's, that's correct. You should design things so that the algorithm has to relearn. Where does your passion for this come from? I think it's the, the chase of knowing that there's an explanation just waiting to be discovered mm -hmm. and teased out and tested. Mm -hmm. That we think that there's something weird going on with um, sludge content on TikTok, for example. You know what that is? I don't know sludge content. Have you seen these videos where it's like a split screen and one part of it is like a Family Guy clip and the other part is just like someone cutting up slime? Yeah, I, I saw a video that someone someone took a clip from my uh, interview with iDubs and there was there were four different things going on in the screen. Right, at one right, time. exactly. And so we get panicky about like, oh, attention spans and what's wrong with us and all of this. And I'm like, hmm, what is really going on here? And I haven't given this a lot of thought, but I'm like, before TikTok, before the internet, people would like talk to each other, but like watch the birds at yeah. the same time. Wait, people had short attention spans in the past? People would divide their attention. They would talk on the phone and they would also watch the cars driving by on their street. Mm. That's sludge content pre-internet. That's true. Just because I wanna listen to the Family Guy clip doesn't mean I can't also be like looking at someone cut slime. People say that attention spans are becoming shorter and shorter, that it's gonna basically be the downfall of humanity. We've always felt that way and I don't believe it. I think that these internet fears are what I call phonio, faux neo, fake new. It's not really a new problem. It's just human behavior doing what it's always done for tens of thousands of years, but with like a new costume on. And the older generation is always gonna say what the newer generation is doing is gonna be the downfall of humanity. Because that's that, that evolutionarily makes sense. They need to worry about the, the youth and they would cling to what worked for them because it worked for them. If you lived long enough to reproduce, then sharing that culture with those that come after, it's a smart bet. This is tried and true. I've done it, I've survived, I've gotten to the point where I'm at now. It has to be this way. Yeah. Do you know why we put wheels in mice cages? To give them something to do so they're not bored? Yeah, sure. But what do you think happens if you put mouse wheels out in the forest. I would imagine that mice would not use them. They do. They do? They love it. Why is Wild that? mice love running on wheels. It has nothing to do with needing an outlet. It's just that they love doing it. Why? I think it's a behavior that they like. It's a, it's a stereotypic behavior of an animal. It's not because they're in captivity. They'll just do it. There's amazing video of these like wheels that have just been put out in a the forest. These researchers did this with cameras. Yeah. And, and like wild mice who have the entire world to run in are still like, oh, hey. And I think that's us too. I think that we, we look at these wheels and we think wheels in cages, that's, that's what the internet is. And it's like, uh. we've, we love running on wheels. That's what it is. We love gossip and it's not just the internet that caused it. We've always loved it. This episode is sponsored by PayPal Honey, the easy way to save when you're shopping on your iPhone or your computer. It's a free browser extension that scours the internet for promo codes and it applies the best one that it finds to your cart so you no longer have to stare at that empty discount code box when you're at checkout because if Honey finds a working coupon, a little Honey button drops down and all you have to do is click apply coupon. And Honey supports over 30,000 stores online ranging from tech to popular fashion brands and yes, food delivery. So no matter what, you're set. Honey has personally saved me a disturbing amount of money on my ridiculous science experiment escapades. Like for example, recently I just saw what would happen if I put 30 pounds of gel in my hair and it looked pretty good, I'm not gonna lie. 
Thank you, Honey. And Honey doesn't just work on desktops, it works on your iPhone as well. You just activate it on Safari on your phone and you can save on the go. It's quite literally free and it installs in just a few seconds, so it's kind of ridiculous if you don't already have it, but if you want to do yourself a solid and also support this series, get PayPal Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash Padilla. That's joinhoney.com slash Padilla. And I can't go without thanking BetterHelp for sponsoring this episode. Therapy has completely reframed my view of the world and myself by allowing me to feel empathy for my younger self and therefore understand who I am today better. But therapy can be customized to whatever is right for you and can be useful in helping with motivation or feelings of depression, anxiety, stress, insecurity, or whatever else you might need. BetterHelp screens all their therapists to ensure that they have experience and that they're certified and licensed and provides customized therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone or even speak over the phone if that's not something that you're comfortable with. And as you may have found out by now, therapy can be expensive and the price of finding a therapist that you like and that you connect with can be overwhelming, which is why BetterHelp offers a more affordable alternative to in-person therapy where you can start communicating with your therapist in less than 48 hours. And those are just some of the reasons why I wanna thank BetterHelp for sponsoring this episode. We're giving I Spent a Day with viewers and listeners 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash Padilla. That's betterhelp.com slash Padilla. Now back to the world of Vsauce. And you don't just theorize different topics and research them. You've made videos where you put yourself in the experiments where you can come up with your own interpretation of how you feel in that experiment. There was an episode of Minefield where you went into complete isolation for three days. You started the video off by saying some people could even get brain damage mm -hmm. from cutting off all their senses, essentially. I guess all you're doing is seeing the color white in this white room. What was that like? Three days. Looking back on it, it feels like it was nothing. Like, I, I feel like I barely spent any time in there. Yeah, so, so you're like, your memories of it feels like it's a very small like, sliver. Because nothing happened. And um, it was so well run. I think looking back now, I just think that the crew on Minefield made that happen so well. Because I was like, I cannot be disturbed. I do not want to know what time it is. And they had shifts. And I could hear like the door open, you know? And so they surrounded it with fans. Like so when that there I go was to my this, therapist's office noise. and they just have all those fans around. And I'm yeah. like, oh, they're trying to stay cool. I'm like, oh, it's privacy. It was privacy, exactly. And so I could not tell. The, uh, the one thing that kind of gave me a clue was that I ran out of water. My faucet was just connected to a big tank mm -hmm. and I ran out and I was like, uh, I don't know how much time I have left. Do I need more water? Uh, and like I went to bed and when I woke up, it worked again. And I'm like, okay. There's so a lot more time here. There's, some, there's also, there's someone around. So it's probably not like three in the morning. Well, because the three in the morning person might not be on the props team who knows how to connect the water. Mm. But see, that's all there was to think about. Every moment felt the same as the last one. So there was no sense of time passing. Right. All you I can... only lived in the present. I think I said at one point that it felt like maybe how a bug experiences reality. You're just here and there's no future and there's no past. But you were kind of thinking about the future. Like there will be a time when I'm not here. I didn't totally become a bug. No, but <laughs> it was weird to have these moments of like, my gosh, I just live in this eternal moment. When I came out, my heart was racing. I was just so like overwhelmed by suddenly all these people and lights and like the world again, that my blood pressure was off the charts and I was like way more focused. We thought that I would be worse at cognitive tasks, but I was better, I think because of the adrenaline. Mm. You go from three full days of nothing to suddenly your mom and your wife and everyone on the shoot and all these doctors and do this and, and you're, you're on camera, you're, it's like, you're a deer in the headlights, except you're not just frozen, you're acting. It's it's fight or flight and I fought. And you just had this adrenaline rush? Yeah. yeah. For how long? Probably for like 24 hours. Damn. It peaked at the very moment they opened the door. Yeah. And then it slowly went down. I remember I went to like Home Depot later that day. I was like, why am I not tired? And it was because I was still like, oh my gosh, look at everything. So do you think, you know, based on your interpretation of what you experienced, that it's good to step away from 
all the stimulants in our life for, for at least a certain period of time? Yeah, I think it is. I think that <clears throat> not necessarily by locking yourself in a bright room. And becoming a bug. Becoming a bug. I think that meditating is how I got through it. Just listening to your mind like it's a show. Mm. It starts playing memories and like, oh yeah, that was how like a typical day in third grade went. You, just, you would start hearing these voices, not kind of a hallucination, but it was just like a memory. Mm. And I'd be like, yeah, yeah. And you just listen to that. So and you, you relax so much and you feel so much more, I don't want to say present because it's almost eternal. You're also in the past, You're not in the future because you don't have that yet. But that's what got me through it. I spent a lot of time just staring at a wall and listening to my thoughts as though they weren't my own. I need to go back and do it again to have that experience because I think that knowing that it was for a show mm. and that after it was over, I had to like do an interview and all of this. It you just, had to like take all the information and hold it in. I had to really be Michael, the host of Mindfield all the time. Same with ayahuasca. Sure, go to Peru and take this hallucinogenic drug while 12 people with cameras surround you. And like yeah. everything I did was like, oh, what, is he gonna freak out? Those influences don't help. So I was just very boring the whole time. But uh, I did reach a point during that where I did get really scared. And I, I think I would have let myself go. I would have let that ego die if I didn't have to maintain an ego to do the show. Did that teach you about who you perceive yourself to be and how that affects you as a person? What it taught me was that helping people reduces my anxiety. So I was terrified that whole time. But what made me feel better was knowing that I am working together with a crew on a show. And how can I help people in my life and not make it about me? So focusing on that calmed me down. And so I guess in a way I learned about myself that I would get too focused on myself and that that is way less nice of a feeling Mm. Then, for example, sometimes the camera people would like walk across the floor and they wouldn't, they didn't want to walk fast because it would be too loud and they would like creep, but I would hear every little creep and I'd be like, just go, just go. <laughs> and then I realized, thanks for going slow, man. That's cool. Because it's for you. It's for the show. Yeah. Like you're doing your job. And by being frustrated or annoyed by it, I'm not helping. Did any of that stay with you, that feeling of it's okay? I have to remember it. When I get worked up or anxious, I remember that and I go, hey, these people are all just trying to get places. By waiting for them, I'm helping all of us, you know? Yeah. It's like a, yeah, it's a, it's a really chill, cool mindset you know, our producer, like I told him, there's a chance that I'm not gonna do it. Mm. And he was like, that's fine. That gave me the confidence to feel like I was still in control. I remember telling the researcher, yeah, I wanna focus on, under, under the effects of ayahuasca, I want to try to visualize a fourth spatial dimension. And he was like, no, think about like your family and your friends. And I'm like, I don't want to think about that. And then like, I don't know, realize that I'm a terrible person and you know. <laughs> Start freaking out. I was scared of having those kinds of insights yeah. on camera. Right, because it's very personal. It's very personal, yeah. And so I did focus more on abstract mathematical things, but also my relationship to the crew in that very moment. Mm. And I did not think about like, does my mom love me? Mm. Because like she does, but I, I don't know, under ayahuasca, I might have said like, she doesn't. Ah! Did you have any realizations when you were in that state of mind? The importance of helping and thinking of others. I also felt really special because this guy was singing just for me. And I was in Peru. The jungle didn't feel as scary. It felt more like, hey, what's up, Earth? We're all Earthlings. As long as no Martians show up, we all know each other. Uh -huh. But you'd hear the birds and the monkeys and all this stuff and the bugs that were all new, but they weren't new. We're all earthlings. 
Did you feel at peace? No, I felt terrified. <laughs> So, so imagine all of that like hippie stuff I just said, but it's terrifying. <laughs> Why do you think it was terrifying? What was your interpretation because, of it? So my interpretation was, I just kept thinking about an early explorer coming to Peru and, and being given ayahuasca unknowingly. Oh. That you're basically being poisoned. What would I think if I didn't know what was going on, if I didn't know the exact chemicals and how they interact in my brain, and I just started feeling this way and didn't know why? You almost forced yourself to feel the feelings of what it would That's feel right. like I, I to could, be I could, uncomfortable I could with push it. myself to get really uncomfortable, and then I would have to like open my eyes and be like, ah, oh, look at the roof. So if you Pretty. could push yourself to be uncomfortable, you could, in fact, push yourself to be comfortable. That's right. I got close to that ego death moment where I'm not there anymore, I'm not an individual and I was seeing colors with my eyes closed and they were building up structures and that freaked me out and I stopped and I wasn't mm -hmm. able to reclaim it. So you think if, like, if you did not have to be the host, you might've been able to fully have that ego death Yeah, moment? if I had just gone with a bunch of strangers and no one knew who I was and we were all just together as people, I think it would have been a very different experience, mm -hmm. obviously. Some people try to go there in meditative states. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily mm -hmm. with, with what some people would consider the shortcut of ayahuasca. Yeah, yeah. You don't you don't need you don't need the ayahuasca. You don't need the mushrooms or the LSD. It it can be reached through meditation, um, and it can be reached, I'm sure, in all kinds of different scenarios. So, do you ever want to go to that place, even through meditation? Oh, I would love to. Yes, yes. I should, I should try. <laughs> is there a fear though of what that means when you find that state of ego death where you detach from all the things that make Michael Michael? Not anymore. I know that it's gonna be scary, but I wanna be there knowing that I can come back. Mm -hmm. I'm not ready to leave. I'm not ready to be a cosmic being. <laughs> I just wanna be a little, you know, Meatball man. A little mouse on a wheel. Yes, that sounds awesome. <laughs> you wanna stay there where you know what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. But you know what? Neither of these are the scariest experience I ever had on Mindfield. What is the scariest? The scariest was in the episode about truth serums. I went into this doctor's office and they pumped me full of midazolam. What is that? Well, it's, a, it's an anesthetic medicine. It makes you unconscious. And they just gave me little bits at a time. You kind of feel drunk. Oh. So they had an interrogator come in, and my job was to not admit that I uh, am the host of Minefield or Vsauce, I think, oh, right? Okay. I, I had to hide that. And we wanted to see if, as they pumped me full of more and more of these drugs, if I would eventually, like, give out the truth. Okay. And I did. The interrogator was good. Like, I was, like, I was really loopy, and she was like, so what do you like doing more, Vsauce or Minefield? And I answered the question, and, you, you know. You couldn't say none? Right, I couldn't say, because I was trying to pretend that I was a choreographer and all this stuff. And, yeah. But eventually, I kind of forgot that. But um, <clears throat> at a certain point, I went unconscious. Midazolam is really weird, because it's got, like, an antidote that they put right into you, and you just, you're back. Immediately? Immediately. It felt immediate. Okay. I, I've never gone under anesthesia, but I just remember suddenly going from non-existence to here I am. Were you aware that you were non-existent? No. You just, time didn't exist. And so about a year after, or months after that episode, my daughter was born. And on the checklist of life, I'd had, you know, college and a job and a wife and a kid. And those were all checked off. And the only one left was die. And I'm like, suddenly I was obsessed with death. And I looked back at that midazolam experience and I'm like, that's, that's what it's like to be dead. I wasn't asleep. I didn't wake up. I was dead and then I was born again when they gave me the antidote. It was very different, crisp change. Mm. It wasn't like a, oh, that was restful. It was a dreamless sleep of non-existence. And then suddenly I didn't die. I could have been dead. You could have told me that I had died in that moment and I would have said, I know, I could tell it happened. And, and how so, can you tell you're dead if you're not conscious in the dead state? Anthony, I don't know. <laughs> All I'm saying is that as I started to look at the inevitability of death, it wasn't abstract anymore. It was something I'd felt and it was so much more terrifying. Has your life ever been the same since knowing what death feels like? No, I don't think so. I think it's had to, it's, it's really changed how I feel about my life 
and its place in the universe and in time and in history and its brevity and its fragility. Are there different choices that you make because of that? Interestingly, paradoxically, I think I'm less scared of it. Mm. I think I'm more accepting of like, cool. I'm not going to be here forever. You're welcome. <laughs> like it's someone else's turn later. So in that sense, do you think that you are living more so from a place of abundance? Like everything else is extra. I'm already living. This is all. I don't know. I, I often will, you know, see like a billboard about, let's say, um, I don't know, Ryan Reynolds. And I'm like, we're alive at the same time. What are the chances? What a cool thing. That's true. Dick Van Dyke is still alive. I was part of the world and human society alongside Dick Van Dyke and John Waters and all, like Dolly Parton, you know? This is, this is a unique experience. Mm. There, there will be people who would love to time travel back to this moment right now, but I'm getting to be here. Do you have any plans to sell Vsauce? I feel like you have so much passion behind it, it would be pretty wild, but. I mean, look, like on the one hand, you can imagine a fantasy scenario where some buyer is like, we wanna buy it and all the IP and all the episodes. And I go, cool, like I'll take all that money and then I'll just walk away and I'll work on um, some new thing. Maybe I have to stay off the internet for three years, but I can make documentaries and movies and short form content, uh, sure. Problem is, I don't know if Vsauce is like worth that much money because I don't run it like it's a profitable thing. Mm. I'm not like pumping it full of brand deals and, and um, creating a pipeline of content that's so strong that it's like, wow, look at the annual revenue. Mm -hmm. Multiply that by five and you're worth a bunch. Mm. It's more like people like what you do and it's cool, but like how are my investors gonna make that into money? I haven't proven that that's what I do. But well, kind of with your curiosity box. The curiosity box is a thing that is, is, is much more like a traditional business. Uh -huh. We've got revenue and Guess what? We did sell that. We merged with Mel Science. So now I'm the uh, chief inspiration officer at Mel Science. I brought you actually a gift. This is a curiosity box item. Wait, can you explain what curiosity box is? First? Yeah, it's a subscription box of science toys that come right to your door. I grew up with a dad who was a chemist. Um, he was a professional scientist and he loved gyroscopes and microscopes and all that kind of stuff. So I was surrounded by it my whole life, but not everyone had five gyroscopes as a kid, but they could, but they can. So that's what the curiosity box fulfills for me is this like, have you not seen this? You're gonna love it. Mm. So for example, this is coming out in the summer, our Daenery dice set. This is a dice set that I designed along with our team that gives you 10 dice. Okay. And there's one for every number of decisions from one to 10. So this is a D1. Okay. This is a dice that only has one number on it. <laughs> This is, this is the worst die in the world, right? Yeah, if you only have one decision to make and you can't make up your mind, roll that one. I'm gonna, all right, all right, if what am I gonna you, get? Let me, let me rephrase, if you, if you only have one choice yeah. and you can't make up your mind, roll that dice. All right, all right. Uh, should I release this episode? Okay. One, one means yes. One means yes. Let's see what you get. One. One, hey, you're gonna release it. All right. Were there any things from that experiment that you've held on to as something that comes up in your daily life? I think I'm just glad that I'm not on ayahuasca all the time. I'm so <laughs> relieved that it was over because it was, um, there, was a, there was a lot of pressure. Like I, I also, I had to do it. Like why else did this whole crew come out? Mm -hmm. No one has ever said, oh, the best way to do ayahuasca is to have it all filmed <laughs> and to do it alone. And have an EEG done of you and a, and a survey about your emotional state halfway through. Right. That's how, that's how the indigenous people of Peru do it. 